Today is going to be the last lecture on thermodynamics of nanomaterials. You must be feeling with bored, so many lectures on thermodynamics and surface energy. Well, we have not done with surface energy yet. Sometime again we will come back to surface energy aspects. But as far as thermodynamics is concerned, we are going to wind up today and then uh, start a new thing or new aspects of the course. First of all, in the last lecture, uh, we learned, I hope, quite a bit about effect of size and the phase diagrams, right? And you know, phase diagrams depicts information about various phase formations and the, the as a function of temperature and composition. So it's important to know how these phase fields are affected by the size of the nanomaterial or the curvature of the nanomaterial. And in the end, I did show you that the simple model can be used to calculate phase diagrams. However, the simple model does not consider the surface energy as a function of composition. We always use surface energy as an uh, you know, isotropic. We do not consider that it is a function of composition at all. Nonetheless, one can do actually calculate the surface energy as a function of composition and plug into the model and calculate. So finally, we derive an equation which is like this, gamma gamma equal to gamma 0 minus uh, what, minus something, right, minus RT log of x a bulk multiplied by x a gain boundary into delta into rho, right. We have explained everything. So what it does it do? It does connect the bulk composition and the gain boundary compositions with the surface energy. That is what is need to be known because in bulk nanomaterials you have both grains and the gain boundaries, right. You have grains as well as gain boundaries both are there. You can see clearly these are the grain and this is the gain boundary. So you, we need to know the composition of XA in the grain that is called XA bulk. Obviously atoms inside the grain is like in bulk because its bonds satisfied in all the directions. So therefore one can consider the composition inside the grain as X A bulk, whereas the composition in the gain boundary is X A G B. We have discussed why this composition has to be different in the gain boundary and the grains, right? Let us not go back to it. So then once you have information about this gamma as a function of composition, you can put in the model, simplicity model we discussed, we are not going to go back again because of time constraint and many other issues and one can do this. A delta is the thickness of the gain boundary and rho is the density of the gain boundary. That is a difficult term to calculate. Well, that can be calculated by knowing the gain boundary structure, whether it is high angle, low angle. Let us not go about all these details. You can assume some numbers and do this calculation. But delta is a thickness which can be measured experimentally by looking at the microstructure using transmission electron microscopes. It is possible to do that. On the right side, I am showing a phase diagram between silver and copper and with the effect of size, right. Effect of size means for the spherical particle with radius of 10 nanometers and 2 nanometers is shown. And there is a dust exchange in the melting temperature, eutectic temperature as well as the composition. You can see that. Well, and this is the issue copper nickel binary phase diagram I am showing you again and again because this is the simplest possible phase diagram in the in the metallic system available. That is why this is this this aspect of effect of size can be easily understood by looking at these simple phase diagram very easily. Okay. 
so uh, okay let's not go back so that means what this whole discussion was built on basically grain and gain boundary structure and the composition difference of gain and gain boundary right and we assume that gain boundary has different composition the grain that's basically observed in fact even in many of the nanomaterials by doing experimentation people have seen it this mainly because of the gain boundary acts as a much different identity than the grains grains has atoms nicely ordered and their bonds are satisfied in all the directions in the grain boundaries atoms are haphazard quite a bit of randomness is there in the atomic arrangements as well as the atoms actually has a lot of freedom to move from one place to other so that's why gain boundary structure is different from the grains and gain boundary can accommodate solute segregation segregation of the solute like in an alloy of a and b b is a solute so solute can easily go and segregate the gain boundaries and change the characters to gain boundary and that can lead to a lot of different kinds of uh, things in the gain boundaries gain boundaries can corrode easily nanocrystalline materials have low corrosion resistance because they have large gain boundary areas the gain boundaries will be having more solids so they will corrode easily when, when it comes in contact with a acidic or a basic solution or even in water okay so therefore uh, this this model which i have discussed can be extended by considering the whole thing grains and gain boundary together this whole thing grains and the gain boundary and gb together as one system and then we can develop a single thermodynamical parameter and that thermodynamical parameter can then be minimized to obtain that how do you do that and that's why actually a scientist called Weiss Muller provided what he did it's a very simple equation he provided you know g total this is for this nano system okay is obviously the physical mixture am I right and then your entropic term is going to come into picture we have seen all this case an entropic term will have two parts one because of grains other one is because of gain boundaries this is something unique right you are treating same material grain as one entity gain boundary as one other entity and this is okay this is okay why because in the grain atomic structure is different than the gain boundaries so one can look at entropic effect in the grain and the gain boundary is distinctly different way so how do you do it okay so for the grains we can write down rt and i am doing that like this x a bulk log of x a bulk plus x b bulk log of x p bulk okay and then for the gain boundaries x a gain boundary log of x a gain boundary x p gain boundary log so log of x p gain boundary so you have physical mixture and the entropic term you must be wondering why physical mixture is not changing okay physical mixture is basically is not at all considering the effect of atomic mixing okay so therefore there is no change of that part because of the gain gain boundary treating as two different entries entities right but then you know we need to also consider excess right excess free energy and excess free energy can be treated like this that also has to be at big treated like that x a bulk h h is the entropic term sorry enthalpic term plus
kite. That's something which can be done easily, right? And uh, one can do this in in the sense that we can treat gains and gain boundaries two distinct entities of the material. And in nanomaterial, in addition to this, we have to add the surface energy term, right? That is gamma A. So you must be saying, oops, such a big equation. But the equation is very simple. We started with simple equation and then added, keep on added terms. So now, if you want to calculate only for the grains, you can remove the gain boundary terms and get it. If you want to calculate for the gain boundary, you can use that, right? The, you can ignore the gain terms. And totality of the system will allow you to calculate the free energy together. Now, we can easily do this. Uh, we can assume a spherical particle, okay? A spherical, basically grain. If you assume a spherical game, okay, of diameter d, then what will happen? Then you can clearly see A G B will be equal to 6 pi d volume. Well, you must be thinking, how do I get it? Very simple, why? Right? A by V, which we have done, is basically 4 pi r square and this is by 4 by 3 pi r cube. So, that is because 3 by r, okay. r has to be written properly, otherwise you will not make a mistake, right. Uh, this is 6 by d, am I right? Well, so that is something which is, is very easy to do. And so, once that means if you plug in this A into that, okay, what do you do? You plug in this A here, volume of gain can be calculated easily, right? Even from the microstructure, you can calculate. Correct? That is not difficult to do. So, now we can see that whole g can be plotted as a function of two things. As a function of d, which is the size of the grain or diameter of the grain, right? And also as a function of the composition of the gain boundaries. Well, you know, that is what something which I need to discuss. If I take an alloy, let us say an alloy of composition A with some 20 percent of B. I mean, it contains 80 percent A, 20 percent of B. Now, in the grains, it will have the same composition. It will not vary too much. Okay. Why? Because the structure of the grain is such that it will try to accommodate atoms in the same ratio of 80, 20, 80 A, 20 B. But because gain boundary structure is different, gain boundary kind of segregation of solutes. So, therefore, gain boundaries will behave differently and therefore, gain boundary composition will not be same as the composition of the alloy. This is true for ceramic system, this is true for polymeric system also. You can have two polymer metal mixing and producing nano al mixed polymer, there also same thing can happen. If you have a gain and gain boundaries, still in polymer this will happen obviously. I want because there is no concept of gain boundaries, so why to worry about it, okay? So that is why this whole G is basically G has three important, uh, uh, basically two important variables, not three. So if I have G, okay, one is function of D, other one is a function of X, B, gain boundaries, correct? So this is a 3D plot. Correct. So, G is basically a function of D and X P gain boundaries. It must be thinking why only X P gain boundary, why not X A? Well, X A gain boundary plus X P gain boundary is, is equal to 1. Similarly, X A bulk and X P bulk, if you add together, that is also equal to 1. So, therefore, this is a single variable, right? One you, want, one you know, other one is easily calculated. So, that means, 
I can actually use this expression of waste molar and plot g as a function of d and x b gun boundaries. That is possible, solid, that b is a solid actually, okay. And uh, that is exactly was done, I will come back to it, exactly was done by the uh, waste molar. And you can see here, this is a g mix, okay. By the way, I should write this is g mix, not g total, otherwise you will get confused. Basically, this is g total only, but you are writing in terms of mix, right. In terms of mix, you are writing it up. So, g mix as a function of gain boundary concentration, x a gain boundary, x p gain boundary does not matter, I told you just now, because both are actually having uh, related to each other. And uh, so, this is what is plotted as a function of x p gain boundary and as a function of gain diameter. So, what do you do? You see a three dimensional plot and 3 D plot has a minimum or minimum basically minimum okay. and that minimum is what you should get because of thermodynamic reasons because of stability that is the energetically minimum position and that is corresponding to a certain value of gain boundary concentration of the element okay, x b x gain boundary and also diameter. So, you can see that we can actually have this functionalism or this functionality of G mix and get the complete picture in the nano scale by doing such a kind of thermodynamic analysis. Okay. So, that is my first part of my things, that is where the most of thermodynamic discussion ends, but we are going to also look at something which is unique. Okay. What is the unique aspects? Correct. Well, you know, as you have seen in this uh, diagram, you see the melting temperature of pure silver and pure copper has gone down. The dotted line is bulk. This is the melting temperature of pure copper. That is about 1084 degrees Celsius. So, 1084 plus 273 that is because it is 7, 1375, uh, 57. Okay. So, similarly, silver has a melting temperature of 961 degrees Celsius, if we add 273, this becomes 1234, right. That is what you see here, correct. This melting temperatures have gone down, although they are pure ends, but this melting temperatures have gone down actually, you can see that. This metallic temperature has gone down, eutectic temperature also has gone down. So, can I you know do a simple thermodynamical model to understand how we to calculate that? And it is for spherical particle, you will see a very simple uh, analogy you can get. Well, so when you are talking about phase transformations, you know at the phase transformation temperature, so at Suppose T is T transformation, okay, T trans, free energy of the old phase must be equal to free energy of the new phase. You can always write down as a G liquid equal to G solid. Why? Because the free energies must be equal at the transformation temperature. Below the transformation temperature, that solid will have higher lower free energy than the liquid and above the transformation temperature liquid will have higher free energy than the solid. This is true for any transformation if you are talking about the ceramic phase transformation also where you have suppose uh, you know in case of cubic zirconia and tetragonal zirconia the same thing will be valid. The free energy of cubic and tetragonal zirconia must be same at the transformation temperature. Well now by knowing that what I can write down? I can write down this G, okay, let us remove this aspect, this will otherwise you know make more complication later on. So, let me write, so I know G is H minus T S, correct? So, I will just write, that means I can write down H old minus T times S old is equal to H new 
minus t trans s nu correct new means new phase old means old phase oh, well one can always do the maths very simple you can write down okay uh, where well, yes here i write down in different color okay delta h uh, is equal to h new minus h old delta s is equal to s new minus s old and delta g is equal to g new minus g sorry g old minus g old right and i write down this as a tens this as a trans this as a trans why do i write trans because this is the change because of transformation change of enthalpy because of transformation change of entropy because of transformation change of free energy because of transformation okay so then what do i write then i can easily write delta g trans is equal to delta g sorry g new g old this is not delta okay and uh, that is equal to delta h trans you can see new minus old minus t trans delta s correct trans correct so this is for the normal bulk systems the moment you have surface energy then you have to add these two terms okay what gamma new a new minus gamma old a old right gamma is surface energy a is the surface area for the new and minus old right you are having change of surface area well why i am talking about it you know even in nonconvolutional system also you can have transformations from one nonconvolutional cube zirconia to nonconvolutional tetragonal zirconia nonconvolutional copper to nonconvolutional eh, sorry nonconvolutional fcc a titanium to an equation acp titanium so this transformation is possible then also your surface energy and the surface area will change so we must consider these aspects in the nano scale so this will be plus 10 gamma nu a nu minus gamma old o a old okay fine so this is something which one can derive very easily from the normal thermodynamics by adding this terms of gamma and a right this is for the nano terms all right so now consider spherical part so spherical particle why do you assume because that makes our life easy you can do is for cubic also cuboid or other things also so for spherical particle you know area can be related to volume you know that right 6 by d volume and then volume can be related to mass divided by density or not mass molecular weight by density right that can done so you can clearly see that's equal to 6m by d rho right rho is the density so this easily one can do now but you know when you transform a phase from one to other you don't change the mass right you may change density that may lead to change in volume uh you may change surface area but mass is not going to be changed because you know you remember the you know very basic thing the mass cannot be lost mass cannot be gained okay well we are not talking about einstein to means of that where mass and energy can be but we are talking about the normal thermodynamics okay where mass cannot be altered so if that is what is case i can write down mass m is spherical particle okay what is that r q old into density old must be equal to 4/3 pi r q new density new right 
So, what is the thing now? R old by R new. Okay, you can see it will be equal to rho new by rho old by one third, sorry, to the power one third. Or we can write down, say simply, d new by d old. D is the diameter, R is the radius, right, of the spherical particle. And rho Am I clear? To the power one third. So, what are the two important relationships we got? Those are the two things we will remember, right? Okay, and rest of the thing will we forget. So, we have seen that A can be related to this, right? We have also seen that the diameters of the particles can be related to density old and new phase. This is something you have learned how to do it right. This is one then I can erase out this one also and use this space for my new calculation right. So, it is understood right. So, far whatever we have done. Okay. So, then what we can do? So, we can come take uh, this equation, you can take this equation and do further calculation. You can see that no, area and the diameter they are related correct. You can see area related by d, d is related to density. So, if you do the maths properly, you will see g times will be equal to delta h times minus t times delta s times plus gamma nu. A nu we can write down 6 m rho nu d nu right minus gamma old 6 m rho old d old right and this must be 0 at the transformation temperature because delta g is this difference this. So, that at the transformation temperature this must be 0 correct. So, one can actually modify this expression further. d new by d old. So, I can d new d old I can replace by rho new by rho old right yes that is what we can do. This will be to the power two third correct. So, now I erase the up so that you can understand easily. I erase the up side, upper side of the slide. You can also I have taken down everything. So, no problem as far as erasing is concerned. One can actually note down or if one can look at the video again and again. So, then I can write down, I can write down t terms is equal to delta h terms by delta s terms minus 6 m gamma nu
divided by rho nu d nu delta s terms into 1 minus gamma old by gamma nu into rho nu by rho old to the power 2 third. Correct? That is what you can get very easily by doing this mathematical jugglery terms, it is obviously 0, right? Otherwise, this equation will not get. So, now one can always uh, think about this ratio as a bulk temperature. You know, you, you know how to get it? Very simple. Delta is basically delta H by T. Okay. You do not know? All of you should know this. Delta H is equal to delta S multiplied by T at the transformation temperature because delta G is 0. So, you can always get that. So, this is the bulk. So, that is why you can get. You do not understand, we can discuss further. Okay. This minus this minus what? 6 this term 6 m gamma nu rho nu d nu delta s terms into 1 minus gamma old by gamma nu rho nu by rho old to the power 2 third, right? Correct. So, that is what you get. Now, I erase this part further and could complete the mathematical relationship easily so that you can understand and get that those temperatures by simply applying this relationship which we are going to derive by this thermodynamical derivation. Fine. So, then I can write down delta T change in the melting temperature is equal to T bulk minus T trans. Okay? That is equal to 6 m gamma nu rho nu d nu delta s terms this is delta s terms multiplied by the whole thing. This we can write down y minus beta that beta is basically equal to this term gamma old gamma nu rho nu rho old to the power 2 third. Correct? So, normally beta will be a small term if the changes are not very large, okay, because this is a, again one we can see multiplication of gamma old by nu old into d rho nu by rho old to the power 2 third. So, this will be a small term. So, one can always assume beta to be equal to 0. Then we can uh, get delta t terms is equal to 6 m gamma nu divided by rho nu d nu delta s terms. Right? That is what you get. Right? So, this tells you that the change of melting temperature, the change of mean transformation temperature is basically change 1 by d. Correct? That is what you get. That is very easy to understand and this law is applied, but to do the calculation you should know molecular weight, you should know gamma nu phase, root density of nu phase and also delta S that is the entropy change. Entropy change can be easily calculated if you know the heat change during transformation. Like in the case of melting, you require to know only the enthalpy of melting that is the latent heat. In case of cubic to tetragonal transformation, you need to know what is the transformation, heat of transformation. That is what is very important. So, simply by doing this mathematical formalism, one can actually do the whole analysis. You can see thermodynamics is so powerful, it gives you all the fundamental relationships which you have derived so far. Okay, so, this is the same thing taken from Dieter Bola's book, a reducing reduction of melting temperature, again delta T as a function of particle diameter for aluminum. Okay. And you can clearly see that temperature is going down from 10 to the power 3 to 10 actually. As you basically 
change in temperature is pretty large as you go down to one nanometer. It's substantially large. It is something on, sometimes it's, people don't even believe such a kind of change can happen for nanoparticles. It's a massive change, okay? This is basically a ratio. Oh, sorry, reduction, delta S, delta T terms. This is basically delta T terms. That's massive. So for about, say, uh, 10, 10, this is about a couple of hundreds, correct? 10 nanometers. And if you go to 2 nanometers, it's become very large, close to even 800. Oh, that's unbelievably low for aluminum. Okay. That means aluminum is 660 degrees Celsius. If you have a, add 273, 660 plus 273 is 3, 3, 9. So you subtract this one, 700. So how much you get? 233. And then you divide minus 273, it becomes what? It becomes uh, minus 60 degrees. This is impossible actually. <laughs> Such a kind of thing cannot happen. But you cannot produce 2 nanometer aluminum particle. It will not be stable. It will be fully oxide. It's so uh, reactive with this, to the atmosphere. Well, same thing has been shown here to be done. Here it is plotted as a function of 1 by D ratio. Correct? So higher the ratio, more is the particle diameter, right? Lower the ratio, larger is the particle diameter. You can see, see if it is 0 0.5 by 1, it becomes what? 100 by 5 is 20 nanometer. So 20 nanometer is the smallest one. No, somebody has got some smaller than that also. Correct, okay, 20 nanometer is point to cosmic to 0.5, and then you go up to about 100 nanometers. And this is the bulk multigram pressure, 930. How much? 933 degrees Celsius temperature is what is the bulk melting temperature of aluminum. So you can clearly see even the experimental data points follow the theoretical curve. So that means that whatever thermodynamic analysis we have been doing it, it is true actually, it is not wrong. It follows the experimental data which has been for, you know, plotted in this case. So these are all available in Dieter's Polar's book. So I will you know, upload some of these portions for your benefit. But please do the calculations or the derivations yourself. Don't forget to do that. Because derivations are very important to know the theory. And then you want to apply for various problem solvings. This is what you need to know. Okay, now uh, so far, whatever time I have, about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes time, we are going to switch over and talk something new. Something new means something new. Because we are going to start the description of, so we have discussed about what? Hierarchical things of nanomaterials, availability in nature, then we talked about surface energy, then we talked about thermodynamics, right? That's, that's total, something about 14 lectures has been spent. Now we are going to talk about properties, and at the end we are going to talk about characterizations of these nanomaterials, right? So before we talk about properties, you must know how nanomaterials are synthesized. Well, that's itself a big subject, okay? Obviously, I cannot talk so much. But I will be able to give you perspectives to that, so that you can understand. You know, synthesis of nanomaterial is a big subject. And uh, in the book of Michael Ashby and others, a lot of things have been written here, okay? So you can produce 1D, 0D, and 2D nanomaterials by different techniques, like discrete nano objects can be produced, or you can produce, uh, you know, surface nano features, or you can produce bulk, Okay, by different routes. So for this kind of nanoparticle, you can use you know, get gas condensations, colored methods, or even you can do, you know, templating. You can even use electrodeposition, PVD, CVD, self assembly. Okay, for surface nanostructures, you can do CVD, PVD, lithographic techniques, or you can do electrodeposition or CVD and PVD. For the bulk, you need to use different kind of techniques like equi equi angle extrusion milling, cryo, room temperature, or even you take a particle, powder particle, consolidator, sintra to get a nanostructure material bulk. You can always incorporate nanotubes and nanorods in the polymeric or the metallic matrices. You can also do rotating starter, PVD or CVD, cyclic electrodeposition, so that you can have a bulk, uh, thicker material possible, right? So these are all, uh, you know, different routes are done. Now we are going to discuss some of these routes. 
There are even many, many routes which are not been discussing. But you know, in a nutshell, if you want to produce synthesis nano, synthesized nanomaterials, uh, there are two processes which are used. One is top down, other one is bottom up. Okay, very funny names. You can see bottom up, top down, top down, bottom up, right? So in a top down approach, you can start with a micro or millimeter size grain structure. Millimeter size, big, big grains you can see by your naked eyes. And then you can break it down into small, small, smaller pieces. Just like you take a chalk, okay, a piece of chalk, and then you big chalk, and then you one by one break and make particle dust. From dust you can make two nanocrystalline particles, right? Or you can do, you know, you can start with atoms. Okay, like you can take evaporation of any metallic things, it will produce vapor. Vapor is nothing but atoms. So those atoms then can actually condense and produce small you know, nanocrystalline materials. This is known as a bottom up approach. You start from atoms, then get down to nanomaterials. That's why it is called bottom up. You can also be intermediate things like mechanical alloying or micro machining. In mechanical alloying, you can start with bigger size particles, break it down to intermediate one, produce nanomaterials. Or you can actually form an alloy to form a nano, from a pure material, so you can form an alloy also. Machining also same thing, you can do a machining operation on the surface and deform the surface to heavily and form nanostructure materials. This is called intermediate things. But mostly you have two types of things, one is top down or is bottom up. Next slide will also explain in details manner. In a top down approach, you can start with the bulk, as I said. Bulk means it's about this pen, the big thing, X, Y, Z, all the things, gain structure, everything is big, millimeter or micron, okay? Gains are very, very big. Then you can make a powder, break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down, and get a nanoparticle, right? So this is basically a destructive process. You break things down. You completely break, 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 then you still get a nanoparticle. Or with the bottom up, you start with atoms, like a vapor, metallic vapor. There are atoms loosely bonded, then it did, they come, condense from clusters, and then clusters grow, they form nanoparticles, right? So the top down example is your ball milling or mechanical milling. Right, bottom approach, chemical synthesis. All the chemical synthesis roots comes under that. You can have, you know, salts, like I have a people here using silver salts, and then silver salts or silver ion, reduce it, and you can get silver nanoparticles by doing something, right? That we'll discuss later on how you can be done. So you understood, right? These are the two classic techniques by which you can produce nanomaterial. There's no other technique available in this world. All the techniques which you are, so will be studying or knowing, they will fall under these two. There are some intermediate techniques of micro machining or something I discussed. Well, first one, we will discuss few of them today's lecture. First one is known as inert gas condensation. This was basically, uh, you know, this basically adopted by uh, Hubert Gleiter, H. Gleiter. in his classic work in 1960s and even 70s, 19, late 1960s and 70s, okay? So in the time of nano starting off, what is done in this case? Well, let me first tell you, this is a vacuum system, okay? Whole thing is evacuated, whole thing, whole chamber. And in this evacuated chamber, you have source like this, this is one, this is another one, Basically, source is nothing but metal, or maybe whatever you want to do, they produce nanoparticles. And then you heat them up. You know, any metal, if you heat up, it will evaporate. Correct? Only thing it requires sometimes high temperature, like tungsten or things. But normal materials under vacuum, it will evaporate and produce vapor. Correct? And then you can actually allow inert gas, like argon and helium. Helium is better than argon. 
but argon can also be used. You can let this inert gas go inside, right? Inert gas molecules then will make this vapor to move forward because there will be kind of collusion of atoms of peanut gas molecules and these evaporated things. So once they are actually moved away from the source because of evaporation, then if you put a cold finger, what is a cold finger? Nothing but a rod which is cold because of flow of liquid nitrogen. So you can actually have flow of liquid nitrogen inside this rod. A liquid nitrogen is very low melt temperature, like minus 196 degree Celsius or 77 Kelvin, right? So if you flow that, the whole rod surface will be very cold. That's why it is called a cold finger, correct? So what will happen? Because these vapors have all moved up due to inert gas movement, inert gas flow, they will all condense on this cold finger. Very easy because this will, this will act as a sink, okay, and all the vapors, because they are vapor, vapor will lose, reduce the energy by forming clusters on the surface of this cold finger. And then you can take, a, take this cold finger down, okay, or basically you do not need to put it down, you can have a, sc a scraper, mechanical scraper, which will scratch the surface of this cold finger, then you can get nanoparticles in a collection tray. How simple is the technique, right? <laughs> It's simple, but the moment you want to devise such a kind of a chamber with all these things, it takes a lot, a lot of planning and understanding and also effort to do that, correct? So that's something which is widely used, very widely used, okay? So this is known as Inas condensation, which has been uh, proposed by Hubert Gleiter in Germany long back. You can also have inert gas expansion. What is that? That's something which is very, very interesting, okay? This is even much better. Because here what happened, because you have condensation of these clusters on the surface of this cold finger, some of these uh, the, the clusters will be agglomerated. That means one cluster will fall on each other and this will lead to agglomeration of nanoparticles. And agglomeration means size cannot be controlled, okay? So an agglomeration will be more and more if, if the condenses evaporation rate, evaporation rate is very high, then the agglomeration will be more. So that's something which is difficult to control actually. Although you can change, check the temperature, control the flow of inert gas, but still those are not enough to have, uh, you know, such a kind of thing. So what you can do in, in, instead is have a, uh, you know, uh, two chamber system. One chamber in which you have evaporation sources, both are evacuated. Okay, you can see the vacuum pumps. And then these molecules are inside this small chamber. And then you can allow, uh, you know, inert gas flow into this, like helium gas flow into this chamber. And then once it flows, it comes out, it expands. You can have a volume expansion. So because of volume expansion, what will happen? There will be adiabatic cooling. You understand that? You are not using any, any cold finger here but you are making this gas to be cooled adiabatically because of expansion. If you, if you immediately expand a gas volume, there will be temperature drop because of adiabatic cooling. The volume is expanding, system is working against it, so temperature will decrease. So as the temperature will decrease, in this gas, these clusters will then form as nanoparticles. They will condense and form nanoparticles. So there will be no uh, kind of agglomerations will be much lower here and this is Later on, uh, developed method, maybe 10 to 15 years after light, Hubert Gleiter developed it. And this is a good one uh, in which you can get good quality of nanoparticles uh, easily. So this is the first technique which uh, is widely used by the uh, initial days of nanomaterial processing and all. You can make these and then you can get powder actually. Then you can send to this powder to get bulk. One can use many other things like sonochemical or solid synthesis, okay? So I will not discuss those things today, but in the next couple of lectures, we will discuss about all these processing routes in little manner. This is available in the chapter, you know, chapter 8, chapter 8 of this book. You can read it thoroughly, this is available very nicely. Thank you.